Elise, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you uh, doing this. I'm, uh, let's say, I'm a fan of you and who you are as a person. I've always, when like when I met you, I've always admired you and like your strength and who you are and like your focus on school and how professional you are. And I'm really grateful to talk to you today. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I'm so glad we reconnected. Awesome. Yeah, me too. So am I. I'm glad you reached out. So with that being said, take us through kind of your transition from making the decision on where you wanted to study leaving high school to where you kind of how you kind of ended up now. And then we'll uh, we'll kind of go from there. Sure. So I am a Southern Ontario person, uh, born and raised. And when I left high school, I was pretty determined to leave that area. And so that's what I did. I went and I studied in Montreal. It was a big city. It was so much fun to be there. I met a ton of really cool people. And um, it was exactly what I really wanted to do. I got out of my Southern Ontario bubble and I felt like it was far enough that I couldn't go home to do laundry on the weekend, nice. um, but close enough that I could still go home for, for family events and whatnot. And so yeah. that was that was kind of the vibe that I was going for. It's big city, but like close enough to family. Yeah, that's fair. So what a, you're a registered psychotherapist currently yes. right okay mm -hmm. and now you specialize in i believe it's anxiety stress and anger management right yep and that's I'm, right i'm sure there's more to it as well and other mm -hmm. things but take us through kind of if you don't mind the process of when you decided that that would be something that you would pursue as a day-to-day uh, -day career yeah for sure this is a little bit of a longer story nice. so perfect yeah i got so all the time in the world when I was in high school, you know how in high school, sometimes people go on trips, they might go on like service trips, or they might have exchanges or anything like that. Hmm. I was the person who said, I don't want to go on an exchange because somebody else is going to run my schedule. <laughs> I want to run my own schedule. I don't want to go on an exchange and do what somebody else is going to want me to do. Yeah, I want to meet people. Yeah, I want to travel, but I want to do it on my own time. And so that was always in my mind when I went to university. And so my first real trip on my own was the year after my first year of university. I went to Peru and that was my first taste of travel. And this is relevant. Yeah. Travel is relevant. Um, so I traveled to Peru. I went on my own. I went with a group uh, that I met up with there, uh, learned a lot of things, got myself in and out of lots of different situations. Oh, and nice. it was a total blast. I loved everything about being in a new situation where I got to meet new people, hear their stories and hear where they're coming from because there was, you know, there was a couple from Belgium and there was like a couple wow. from, you know, just up the road from where I was living at the <laughs> time, but there were from people from all over the place and I was able to connect with all of them. And that was really important to me and really empowering and surprising to me. So when I finally finished university, I knew that that's what I really wanted to do. So all through university, I worked my butt off and I was able to go travel after university. And the same thing, whenever I went traveling and I went on my own, because that was really important to me to mm -hmm. solo travel, took my little backpack and got myself through Europe and Southeast Asia, um, which I guess is the typical travel route at this point in time. But when I went, it wasn't super common for a lot of solo female travelers to go. No kidding. And uh, I loved it. I loved every single moment of it. And I always say that that was kind of the moment where I knew I wanted to be in some sort of helping profession where I could hear people's stories. Um, because everywhere I went, I would meet people. I yeah. always felt safe. There was like very rare circumstances where I felt unsafe as a solo female traveler. Um, but wow. so many times, yeah. And so many times I got to hear really cool stories and people from so many different life experiences. And I knew I wanted to do that, be in something that I could just listen to people's stories and, and be just fascinated with them. And hear what was important to them and just kind of have really cool conversations with people based mm -hmm. on their life experiences and what was really important to them. And eventually that got me to where I am right now, but that was where it started. That was where it kind of blossomed to this is the idea. And then you kind of just picked your way yeah. towards it. So where have you ever been to Lima? Yeah, actually, I flew into Lima um, and I had a whole fiasco the first time nice. that I, flew, I went to Peru. Um, 
Well, I went to take a flight and this is my first time traveling picture, like 18 year old Elise waiting in to get my ticket printed for yeah. the flight. Cause you didn't have these like cell phone check-ins. Uh, it wasn't, it was like, Oh, it was a little bit of time ago. Um, <laughs> and my passport got stolen. Come on. Yeah. So I was standing in oh. the Buffalo airport. So I wasn't even in Canada and my passport was stolen and all of the money that I had to do this trip in Peru. What? Yeah. Oh, so, how does that happen? I know. I know. So somehow by the grace of whatever, um, I was able to get back over the border with my mom and uh, get a new passport and get to get a new flight and figure out how I was going to get to Lima. So I ended up getting to Lima really, really early in the morning. Okay. And as an 18 year old female solo traveler, you, solo. you try not to get places at, you know, anytime at like 1 a.m. or later because yeah. uh, the streets are dark. You don't really know where you're going. There's a lot of like assumptions about like a solo female going around. Um, and I probably looked like a baby. I probably had big wide eyes and was, you know, just such a target. But I, everything ended up being fine. However, uh, I had booked a equivalent of like a limo to get me to where I was staying that night. So that I could meet up with the group that I was traveling with. Yeah. And got into this thing, prepaid for it. I was the only one, and there was the driver. Yeah, the driver got lost, pulled over to the side of the road in the middle of nowhere in a neighborhood to like call his buddy. That's so terrifying. So scary. <laughs> so scary. Um, of course, I don't speak the language. I didn't really understand what was going on, but and you don't have service, you don't yeah. have anything like that. I couldn't figure out where I was. I have learned a lot from this moment. However, this was a good introduction to traveling alone. Yeah. And like what can go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so eventually the, the driver figured out where, where he needed to take me and, oh, and no. me there and it was fine. And I got there and great, no problems whatsoever, yeah. but there was, there was a good, you know, 10 minutes of time there where I was like, I don't know why he's calling someone and I don't know what's gonna happen this you know what I have no idea and this is by this time it's like you know 1 30 2 30 in the morning so huh yeah middle of the night not even morning yet that's oh yeah. my see in a, in a city in a country I've never been in yeah language you don't speak got pulls isn't that your job to know where you're going as a driver like the one thing you need to do in order to be a good driver and like the minimum requirement should be know where the end destination is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. weird yeah i oh. don't know i feel like i feel like in some places there are just so many little streets and alleyways yeah. that have addresses that you just wouldn't really go to necessarily but i mean yeah it was it was a scary circumstance to say the least no kidding so then with the, I like that though. That's funny that the first attempt to Peru, you didn't even make it. You had Basically. to go back and then redo it. And then, oh my, oh yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. that was that my through. introduction. It was my introduction <laughs> to traveling is how stressful it can be. Um, I learned pretty quick, quick that, you know, you have to really take care of yourself. You can't rely on other people when you travel yeah. necessarily. Um, and that's really freeing in a lot of ways because mm you always know where your own stuff is you're never having to worry about someone else and you you kind of fend for yourself and I'm not saying mm -hmm. that in like a everything is terrible kind of way I'm just right. saying it as a you know you're responsible for your own thing and I think when you live in like the society that we live in you don't necessarily always have to fend for yourself there's always something that you can you can get some help from a friend if you have roommates if you have a partner if you have parents or something but i was really in a situation where i had literally nowhere else that i could fend yeah. i could ask for help um and that's how that was my introduction basically to travel and i think it was a good introduction because everything ended up being fine but uh it it kind of colored in in a good way um, what I felt was my responsibility to myself to keep myself safe, to keep myself informed of where I needed to go yeah. moving forward. Interesting. So then, wow, that's really cool. That's really cool. That's a pretty sweet story. Yeah. Wow. So 
wow, because I was going to ask what, when you think of Peru, what is one thing that sticks out to you from that experience? But sounds like you answered that question just with that. Like, that's, that's crazy. Unless oh, there actually, is one thing. No, actually, that's not really what stands out to me. Usually that's really? what I, that's what I'll tell. Like, I mean, that's a good story. You got to get at that, yeah. right? But usually when I think of Peru, I think of the trek that I did. So when you go to Peru, a lot of people do the Inca Trail. Yeah. right and everybody knows about the inca trail yeah well you have to book that thing so far in advance like machu so, picchu yeah to get to yeah. machu picchu to do that because they only allow a certain amount of people on the trail and you're only makes allowed sense. to do so many people in machu picchu at a time um all those things i mean it makes sense for safety reasons for like conservation reasons yeah, that's of a huge course one. Yeah. i just didn't get that option so i did another trek called the laris trek and that track, I think it was four or five days, but it was just, it wasn't as traveled. There weren't as many people on that track, oh, um, cool. but it was, but it was very similar, like beautiful scenery and hard trails. Um, we did have porters to, and, and people cooking for us when we went to all these different places. So it was quite luxurious. Wow. Um, and we'd, we'd have like our tent set up when we got to the end of the area and there was there was altitude and there was you know these there was rain and cold and beautiful sunshine uh, but that was hard it was really hard but it was one of the more beautiful things I've ever done and that was probably where I found my love for trekking in other countries and trekking and as in hiking camping yeah. um, staying in 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 like chalets or or bunky type situations while you mm -hmm. were going because you see a totally different side of the countries that you're in a lot of time people people travel and they see cities and the the countryside and the the wilderness is where you meet a lot of really cool people you have really good conversations with people from other places what's um that you can remember maybe if not from that one but uh from all your kind of experiences overseas or down south or south of the border south of the border um mm -hmm. what is one that not maybe that you've experienced but one that you've heard somebody say or story that somebody's told you or a lesson that they've learned or gone through that has stuck with you that just takes the cake at the top mm. that's a toughie I'm not really sure. There were so many different stories. I think what really stands out to me as a general thing is people would tell me about the experience that they had going the places that I was about to go. Nice. So, so often when you're traveling in hostels or guest houses, wherever it might be, I mean, you run into other travelers that speak English and you ask them about where they've been, where they're going and you swap stories and the feel of you know sitting down you're at a bar you're at a you're out for dinner or something and you're swapping yeah. stories about the places that you've been you're you're giving advice and everybody really likes telling what you should do like giving advice the, yeah. oh this was so awesome i love you should do this you should definitely oh, no. and there's this one random place at the side of the road you have to stop for food that's like the best place you can stop you know there's and, and you get those types of little things because people accidentally go to places and they turn out to be such an amazing experience and then you have that flavor going into the experience you're going into is they've they've told you how amazing it was mm -hmm. and then you get to go and see that with the viewpoint that it's already going to be absolutely amazing and what's interesting is how much that impacts your experience of the next thing Nice. And so I would, I would always, I would always love hearing where people were coming from, what they had yeah. learned and all that sort of stuff. That's cool. So shifting a bit, um, taking that, what was kind of your leaving Peru and then coming back? What was your transition like after your travels that you switch gears, right? And you're like, okay, I know that I want to be helping people. I want to, uh, like, this is it. This is my lane. Once you had that information and you knew that about yourself, how did you put that into something 
as psychotherapy? Like how did that kind of stem into something that's um, now provides you your living? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I had a couple of years in there where I was traveling, but then I also was in Canada and I was working. Mm-hmm. Um, and so over the time period of maybe four years or so um, between graduating from my undergrad and starting my master's in psychotherapy, Mm -hmm. um, I did travel quite a bit, um, but I was also in Canada quite a bit and meeting people and all that sort of stuff. And when I finally started my master's, um, it was kind of by fluke, to be honest. Well, way? I was applying to places to be a physical therapist. You know? Oh, right. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, Glenn, right. you, you and I, uh, we met working in like a, a exercise facility, yes. right? Like we, we basically worked in a gym together. That's how yeah, we know essentially. It. Yeah. And, um, and that was, that was a huge part of my life was exercise and fitness. Oh and, yeah. And, you know, I was, I've been on various sports teams throughout my life. That was a huge, huge part of my life. And so because of all the time I'd spent in a gym and helping people and preventing myself from being injured, Mm -hmm. I wanted to do that for other people. I talked to so many physiotherapists in my life and I wanted to do that because I thought it was really cool. And I had some really good physiotherapists who would like chit chat with me and they would explain things to me and the biology and physiology of it was fascinating to me. And so I was applying to all these physical therapy uh, programs and then uh, someone very dear to me said, oh, hey, I, you know, I saw this program for psychotherapy and, you know, maybe you should apply to it. So I did. And I got in and the excitement that I felt (laughs) That's when I got crazy. into the program, <laughs> what far outweighed any other excitement for any of the other programs. Um, really? Yeah. What do you think that is? I think my gut knew that I just wanted to go in the direction of psychotherapy rather than physical therapy. Um, and I think my idea of physical therapy was, well, I've done this my whole life, basically. I have a very good understanding of the connection between body and mind. Mm-hmm. And I would talk to my I would talk to my physios about that as they would talk to me about like mindset and all that sort of thing. So I think I knew I liked that. And I think I thought it was part of the job description a little bit more than it actually is although a physiotherapist can correct me on that one (laughs) but but then so getting into a psychotherapy program that was the moment that I was like oh yeah this is good for me and it kind of clicked into place (laughs) interesting huh Mm -hmm. I always find it fascinating when people have those aha moments or those moments that they didn't realize or they didn't know that that that's what they wanted until it took place right like there are Mm -hmm. some people i'm aware of that i'm friends with now or i've had on the show in the past and they're like i knew this is what i wanted to do i've always been a jolly outgoing type of guy and i've always wanted to pursue acting so that's why i'm an actor now i'm like all right you know cool but some people aren't as lucky and some people have to go through those experiences to find out Mm -hmm. right so Mm -hmm what I'm wondering is how do people go about from your experiences and what you've seen, what do you recommend for people to go through um, or to experience even in order to find that answer or to get that? Oh yeah. Now I know what my lane is. Now I know what I want to do. Yeah. I think, you know, my favorite thing to say is you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So if you're in a situation where, you know, your parents were in business or like entrepreneurial and all that sort of stuff, I mean, you know, business, that's what you know is like a viable career. So Mm -hmm. even if you're going to be an engineer or if you're going to be a librarian or you're going to go into business in order to figure out what engineering is or what it is to be in a library, be a librarian or what it is to be a psychotherapist, you have to step out of your comfort zone and your comfort zone is the business route because that's what Mm -hmm. you know. And to step out of your comfort zone requires you to learn something new. And then you can Uh say, Oh, I know that now I see that I've, I know stuff about that, Mm -hmm. but you can't, it's really hard for someone to jump blindly into into something that they know zero things about because where's the passion going to come from passion comes from knowing a little bit about it and being excited about a little bit 
Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's where it was like for me is that I knew a little bit about it and I was interested in it. Mm-hmm. And so I knew a little bit. And so I, when I was able to jump into it, I wasn't jumping in into the darkness. I was jumping into something that I thought was already pretty cool, but right. didn't really have the like theoretical knowledge or anything behind that. Mm-hmm. So what I would say to people is do some research, talk to people, ask people what they really like about their job, what they really like about what they do, because you might hear something that really resonates with you and you may not know why in that moment, but at least now, you know, something that you didn't know before. Right. Ah, that's cool. I mean, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like trying different things. I think the going out of your element part is huge. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of people that maybe and I I don't know if blame is the right word but I guess that might that I know it tends to fall on like the parents like the influence of parents on their kids is mm-hmm. huge oh yeah like oh yeah I know people crazy. who grew up grew up being told you know, well, you're going to be a doctor when you grow up for sure. Like I'm a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. So that's the only way that they go. And so of course, the only thing that they, they've they been exposed to and the only thing that they know is that they're going to be a doctor. Yeah. And so it actually creates that much more anxiety and fear of failure when you try something a little bit different. Because when you know, when you know, and I'm like using hash, like quotations here, when you know yeah. <laughs> that you have to be a doctor, yeah. then everything else is unknown. And everything else uh, feels maybe like a failure or maybe like going off what you're, you know, quote unquote, supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And that can be a really scary point. And this yeah. doesn't have to be like, you know, you don't have to leave high school and say, well, I'm going to be an engineer for sure. Cause my dad's an engineer or whatever, you know, you have, you have flexibility, you know, people transfer programs all the time. Yeah. And you're able to try out different courses or read stuff. You can do that sort of thing. You just have to take the time for it. Talk to different Mm -hmm. people. It doesn't mean you need to, oh, I don't want to, you know, my dad's an engineer. I'm supposed to be an engineer. Well, actually, I'm just going to apply to a poli sci course because I think that would be a different place to go. I mean, it's, you don't have to jump two feet in. It could be smaller explorations into things you don't know or the unknown. Right. Yeah, before you drop twenty five thousand dollars on yeah. an education that you don't end up using or getting anything out of, per se. Yeah, for sure. Like taking a leave after your last year of univer- uh, sorry high school is. Some people love it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know anyone who's taken a leave after high school. Quite a few people, and they all say, "I've never heard anybody say." the opposite of what you just said they're all like oh i took a victory lap that's one that that's a common one that a lot Mm -hmm. of like uh the guests i've had who are my age or a bit younger on the show have often said the victory lap made a huge difference for them they were able to focus more on the programs and learn a bit more there was less stress they were it was new people right because it was Mm -hmm. the year below them so they the focus was more on what they were doing or making a decision and it gives you a whole nother year to do it. And so I think doing that, whether it's in the victory lap or like you said, just taking a year leave, I guess, afterwards Mm -hmm. and going exploring. then that's, I think that as itself is an unbelievably freeing thing to do. I don't know how easy that is, Mm -hmm. but question for you Mm not if you could wave a magic wand and go this is the perfect way to do it from what you know and what uh you've learned kind of what like leaving that what's that transition supposed to look like what is it like three years high school is it like seven is it six months instead of a year is it oh now we jump after graduating you go right into university or you go into this program or you go across the world like what uh what's that look like in a perfect world I don't know. I think, I think it differs for people. Some people don't like travel. Some people want to work right away. Some people, some people know like lucky people to leave their high school and know what they want to do. That just wasn't my experience. You know, if it, if it was someone who was exactly like me, I think probably what would have been a a really good way to do it was finish out high school. Don't really know how long high school would be, but, but then to have like six months off, 
to travel, to explore, to rest and hang out with friends. Yeah. But but with the purpose of having a little bit of a time or a little bit of new people time. So not really yeah. spending six months just hanging out with your friends that you've known for forever, yeah. um, but really taking the time to do something new, whether that's a trip or like, a, I don't know, a service trip, a mission. A lot of people find a lot of value out of like a mission. Um, but then and then to go to university or or something or or college or you know a diploma program or then to start a job what or an apprenticeship mm-hmm. any of those things that you know where you have a little bit extra time i think yeah. through the pandemic what we've really learned is that people need to slow down and you know, to all the people who are in high school, there's a lot of pressure when you're like 16, 17. It's absurd. It's crazy. It's yeah. like, here, decide the rest of your life. What? Nobody's going to do that. Nope. <laughs> I mean, I'm all. case in point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unreal. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's, uh, we talked, we touched about it, about it recently when we chatted before doing the show because you know i like to do that kind of meet and greet icebreaker go through the process of it so we can have the greatest time ever so we talked about when we worked together at the athletic facility you mentioned earlier um and there was that heart attack victim yeah um that i had to deal with and i have yet to talk to any of the people involved um about this specifically since then but I noticed now it took place on 2017, February 2nd, mm-hmm. on a thurs- Thursday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Thursday. Evening. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, like 737, whatever. Anyways, um, what I'm wondering, every single year on that day in the more like the later afternoon, evening, I get really bad like anxiety and I attest it to that situation like even a month or two ago that was the same similar thing i was like oh today i was like why do i have why is there this like build up of like why am i drained it's thursday like it's like it's a short day it's not too bad you mentioned trauma anniversary when we were talking about this off the air before mm-hmm. can you kind of explain and elaborate like because now everybody's experienced it with covid and why that's a big big deal that affects us Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So essentially, a trauma anniversary is exactly what it sounds like. It's an anniversary of a traumatic event. And this happens in so many different ways. It also can be kind of, you know, grief can have anniversaries. So if a loved one of yours dies, it's far more common for you to get memories triggered of your loved one on anniversary days or, or even days that are important. So if we're talking about a loved one, you know, maybe their birthday, you might feel another wave of grief, or maybe, you know, over the holidays, you might feel another wave of grief, because all of those memories of that person come up in that time the same sort of thing happens when we're talking about trauma because Mm -hmm. trauma I mean you hold trauma in a certain way until you process it it can impact your body it can impact your mindset Um, and some people are able to move on some people are able to suppress it trauma looks so different for so for every single person I mean you can have a single traumatic event and you can have five people and all five people might experience it completely differently Um, But when you come up to your one year or your two years or your three years, it's a reminder of the events that happened. And it's totally normal to have those reminders be kind of a hit to the gut or kind of make you feel a little bit crappy for a little bit for a few days, because Mm -hmm. it's a reminder of hard things. And trauma is, is a complicated beast. And when you are reminded of those things and if you've not really dealt with it or if you you know are a normal person and remember things that are traumatic Mm -hmm. uh then it can be really tough to do that and you know we were talking about trauma anniversaries in the context of covid before yeah and i mean i don't remember today's march 27th or whatever and so march 14th or 15th was the official time that we we shut down for the pandemic in 2020. And so more recently, it was a year of COVID. 
Yeah. And that was, that was like a trauma anniversary for, for yeah. everyone to sit everyone. down and be like, okay, it's been a year, a whole year. Yeah. How are we doing? Yeah. yeah. It brings up, it brings up a lot of feels and, yeah, and people don't realize the impact of trauma. Uh, you know, people often will not, and this is the thing about trauma. You know, I mentioned that the same event can impact people so differently while different events can also impact someone similarly. So if you, trauma is not an objective thing. So if, you know, somebody gets in a car accident yeah. versus somebody has like a near death experience versus somebody gets hurt by a friend through like, I don't know, a three-way call or something and they're hurt by a friend. Somebody could be traumatized by equally by every one of those things. And each of those things could be experienced by other people in very different ways to differing mm -hmm. extents of trauma. And so when we're talking about COVID, we're talking about everyone, millions, billions of people having very different traumatic responses to mm -hmm what's been going on. And so some people may be like, yeah, this is no issue, whatever. I'm cool. Um, and yeah. some people might be taking this really, really hard. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that I found, <laughs> excuse me, usually in the past before 2020 kind of begun and somebody who I'd reconnect with, somebody like, Hey man, how you doing? It was such an easy answer. I can be like, Oh, good. You know, or, or, you know, if I want to carry the conversation on, just answer a bit better than that. Um, stuff like that. Right. But now people are like, Oh, how you doing? And I'm like, well, I can't drink my coffee because I'm full of depression. So, mm -hmm. you know, like little things like that, that are just luckily um, I'm grateful enough that only two weeks of the whole 2020 or ever since COVID kind of began that that's all I had of no work. Mm -hmm. So I've always had somewhere to go every day, something to do every day. So I'm extremely grateful for that. But how's it been? Like, is that something that like you've been able to keep going? Like, how's that adjustment been like for you? Yeah, no, it's been good. I mean, I have, I have a couple of loves in my life and I always like to help people. I just have different skills to go about doing that. So one of those skills is being a psychotherapist and the training that I've been through, which I love to do every day. That absolutely mm. gets me up and, and going. Nice. Um, the other thing that I really like to do is just organizing people, administrative organizing. So I have held both of these things in my life throughout the pandemic nice. um, but it hasn't always been possible because so many companies have shut down and so when I've been doing some of the administrative roles I haven't always been able to continue them due to COVID mm -hmm. and so I get what it's like to lose your day-to-day -day purpose for getting up and not be able to do that for a little while and it's hard, right? A lot of people hold their identity in work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very. <laughs> and when that, get, that gets taken away, it, it's so hard to find other ways, especially when you can't do anything. You know, people, yeah. people, it might be helpful for people if, you know, if they lose their job or if they can't work at their job for whatever reason, that they could have other things to do. Like they could go exploring, they could go traveling, they could find a different purpose. It's just not... It, possible right now not at all Damn. yeah yeah it's one of those things that's very very it's a sensitive thing but it's a reality and it's yeah. really unfortunate I know so many people close to me that they just they're studying at home they can't go to the gym because everything's mm -hmm. closed they can't even like leave their house to go visit certain friends or certain family because they might have like some might have allergies to different things. And if their immune system in any way gets compromised, like, oh, if yeah. you didn't sleep enough the night before, like, and I have an allergy, like a really bad allergy. And then like we hang out and then all of a sudden I can't breathe as well. Like, it's just the whole mess mm -hmm. that could easily happen. Right. And that's something that I think is, again, I'm grateful for my situation, but I know there's so many people that aren't in it mm -hmm. and have it for worse. Sure. And yeah. that's, it's 
it's tough. It's a tough reality to uh, be faced with. So absolutely. And I think it's important, though, to note that even if you do have a job, and you have had a job consistently, that the pandemic has not been easy on people who have the jobs too. No. Oh, I mean, no. we were we were talking just before this, I was like, Oh, I went for a walk just before we we got to chat because I yeah. needed it as my transition time. And transition time essentially is giving your your brain and your body a little bit of time between tasks so that you can refocus. You can refocus, you can reset, you can get back into, you know, feeling at your hundred percent because you can't just work all day. So no. People have lost their commuting time. So commuting time, oh, sucks so much. Everybody hates commuting, right? You yeah. want you don't want to drive. You don't want to take a bus or whatever. Um, but commuting time actually has quite a lot of importance for how to separate your work and your personal Interesting. life. Interesting. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and say like your work and personal life needs to be completely separated. There are times right. for that and times for, and times not for that. Um, but if you do need to be able to leave work at work and you need to be able to leave home at home, or mm -hmm. you find that they bleed into each other and, and distract you, then having a transition to commute to work was probably super powerful and you get yeah. that taken away because of the pandemic and a lot of people weren't finding ways to transition in the same way and so i've taken up the practice of walking between yeah. whatever i've been doing to start things off or... interesting mm -hmm. wow because i that's funny you mentioned that because i had a i have a friend i had i have a friend who was <laughs> on the show my buddy pat and he he's a massage therapist and his whole thing is he's and like a competitive power lifter but he swears by walking every day like mm -hmm. that's his he's like he's a big dude and i'm like why are you why do you want to walk every day and he's like D walk every day clears up your mind but i never would have thought of it as like a transitional thing like to you would even recommend you, as far as using it as that right like just go yeah. for a 10 minute walk after this before i go to the next thing Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're stuck at home and working, if you're staying in your home, doesn't matter how bright or awesome your in-home gym is or how awesome your TVs are. If you're not breaking up your routine um, by ideally not looking at a screen, if that's what you do, um, then then you're just you're you're staying in the same environment and your environment is not changing just by getting up and walking around your block for 10 minutes, you're changing your environment, you're changing the way your body is holding itself. So you're getting your your heart rate up your um, your mind is seeing different things. Your eyes are adjusting to different things because it's also not good to, for your eyes to be looking at a screen or looking at something oh. close for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually, it shifts your mind. And huh. that's the important part is that you focus on something else. You can see other things and you get yourself out of the mental headspace of being in your work mindset for at least a little bit of time. No way. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. I know what I'm doing right after this because I have a bad habit of that. I have a really bad habit of that. I'll like, but I work out of like, I'll, I have the commute to work, but I find after I'm like, go, go, go. I'm still going. Then mm -hmm. even like today, it's like, wake up. Okay. I'm on my computer on yeah. recording, like researching you, like <laughs> doing this, like same thing and then recording. And then I'm probably going to go back after pull something up on YouTube or go to edit. It's all different, but it's all on the screen. It's all on the screen and it's all kind of for the same sort of purpose, right? Yeah. Like maybe, maybe you got up and got out of bed and went straight to your screen and started working. But, you know, if you had taken 10 minutes to kind of wake yourself up. So, yeah. you know, here's another way to think about transition routines is when you get up in the morning and you had a job to go to physically, you know, you're getting up, you're having your breakfast, coffee, uh, you know, maybe you do a workout, maybe you shower and get your clothes on and everything that right there is actually a transition routine because you're transitioning from sleep to work mm -hmm. because you're getting yourself ready uh, mentally and physically for the next stage of your day, which is this work day. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. And what doesn't happen is people don't go backwards to get to sleep. So that's why so many people have sleep issues. So 
think about it. When you get home from work, you're watching Netflix, you're taught, you know, you're on your phone, you're scrolling through Instagram. And then you're like, okay, like it's time for bed. You brush your teeth, you put your pajamas on or whatever you get into bed. And then you're scrolling through your phone. You're like, okay, sleep time. And you turn your phone off. Where are the <laughs> you cameras you have hidden in my house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then That's you're, terrible. you're like laying there wide awake. You're like, oh, what? what is going on? I'm like wide awake. I should be tired now. That's crazy. But when have you given yourself an opportunity in that after work time to actually get ready for bed? What you gave yourself five minutes to brush your teeth, wash your face and put clothes on for bed. That's not enough time for your brain to start winding down. So then like adding reading to that phone's Mm -hmm. like off, it's away from you out of your bed, not in hands reach. And then it's yeah. out of the way charging doing whatever but then like yeah. reading because i've found that it's similar to me that's something i've got out i've tried to get out of since the year started was okay like i give myself a half hour of no screen when i wake up and then when mm-hmm. i go to bed and, and I think the wake up is huge. For you. it's huge i just feel more even with my day being as busy and go 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 as it is and quoting jobs and hammering building walls it's still i'm very I'm very in the moment of what's going on. And I find I'm really bad. Like when I get anxiety, it's really bad. It's not like, oh, yeah, it's like, I'm just, why am I anxious today? Mm -hmm. Like I just feel, you know, when you wake up and you're like, you're tired, but then you kind of get energized as the day goes on. Mm -hmm. I won't get that on those days. And that's a very, that's something very weird that I haven't quite been able to figure out why it's been less like less reoccur. It's been reoccurring way less ever since I've been doing that. It's still something weird that comes around. I'm like, why, why is that happening? But it's definitely made, it's made a difference. And I think walking is something that I'm going to implement more because that's Mm -hmm. the outside fresh. I'm like, I should go for a walk. It's a beautiful day. And then I just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Walking is super important. Like even if you go for a walk before you go to bed, right. Sometimes it's Mm -hmm. really hard to act actually stay away from your phone for 30 minutes before you go to bed Brutal. you can go for a walk hey I am totally in that boat as well <laughs> I know how hard it can be you can scroll through check your emails whatever it might be but mm-hmm. if you go for a walk for 10 minutes don't take your phone then you have so many things to look at and it's also like part of that transition it's getting your mind ready to go to bed to go to sleep because it's not really fair like let's be real it's not really fair to your brain to yourself to be like working right up until you go to bed at what 11 Mm -hmm. or whatever and then immediately expect yourself to go to sleep I mean your mind doesn't turn off like that as much as we want it to and it's just not realistic so you know if I can impart any knowledge to you it's (laughs) have some sort of like going to sleep routine. It's not like, it doesn't have to be like this bedtime routine where it's like really long and extravagant, but just with the purpose of slowing your mind down so that you're not running at like a thousand miles an hour Mm -hmm. and then sleep will come that much more easily. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. That's really cool. I really appreciate that piece of information. Wow. No problem. Nice. That's what you do, eh? (laughs) That's your thing. That's your bread and butter. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So what's um, of all like the I'm sure you've had success stories and like all the patients you've had. And obviously, I don't like I can't expect you to give like examples and stuff like that or even like specific stories just without names. But um, what I'm curious about is what's your like counseling process from when they find you and they call for a consult, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. And then they meet with you, they set up their time and then uh, they don't, I guess, need your help or need your services anymore. What's that Mm -hmm. kind of look like? Like what's, what's a success uh, blueprint for like a success story of that? Yeah. If that makes sense. I'm, I'm really glad that you asked this question actually, because, because this, the therapy process for so many people is this like mysterious being people don't, necessarily know what it looks like or what it should look like or what it should feel like and and the truth is that therapy always looks different because you're basically having two humans have a conversation one of them happens to be trained to notice things but you're talking about the things that the the client or the patient is experiencing and so obviously everybody's experiencing is so different 
but there are some things that you should feel. So let's go to the beginning. There are a couple different ways that you can find a therapist. Um, one of the best ways is just to go on like a, a database online. One of the ones that I can think about is psychology today. And so a lot of therapists will have a profile on psychology today or Google or wherever it might be. There's a bunch of different databases out there and you can do a search based on location, based on, you know, if you're looking for a certain like a, a therapist of a particular gender or if you're looking for a therapist of a particular religion or um or focus, for example, some therapists um, are only like anger based, they only work with anger, or they only work with anxiety. And so you can search that you can actually find someone based on certain criteria that you're looking for. And that's your first step is to just kind of look through, browse through some profiles. Um, what people really need to know at this point is that you're looking for someone's profile that speaks to you. You the most important thing about the therapeutic process from start to finish is that you feel comfortable and you feel like it's a good fit. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the most important thing. And that's the most important thing based in research for effective therapy is that if you don't have a good fit and the relationship that you build with your therapist isn't good, then mm -hmm. you're not going to get as far as if you had the exact same process and, and type of, of, um, type of treatment uh, yeah. if you liked the therapist and you thought that they were a good fit for you. So that's something. So some therapists offer consultations and through these different databases or, or through Google or something, you can usually reach out by email or phone to a therapist and you can absolutely ask for a consultation. And so some therapists will do consultations for you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, some of them are paid, some of them are unpaid. Um, and I recommend doing a consultation because you get a good, it means that you get to chat with the therapist and get a feel for them. Um, and first impressions do matter. hundred percent, especially in that, I can imagine like in that dynamic, huge. For sure. You're going to spend hours of your life talking with this person. Yeah. Sharing intimate details, everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So do a consultation, check in with yourself. I always tell my new patients, you know, check in with yourself while we're in the conversation, check in with yourself after this conversation, check in with yourself three days later and make sure that things are, you know, that things are feeling okay because the fit is of utmost importance. And I always stress that because it truly is. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's like leading up to the consultation. And then what happens is usually you book an appointment and that first appointment is kind of like a get to know you appointment. So some people will refer to it as like an intake appointment. And that is where you talk about confidentiality and you talk about the things that you should expect in therapy. And in that conversation, your therapist should give a little bit of an idea of how they approach therapy, what their what their approach is, what their modalities are, um, and to explain those modalities, give you lots of opportunity for questions. And then they should talk to you about confidentiality. And so confidentiality is, you know, we're having a conversation. I'm not going to tell people about this conversation. If your best friend or partner or, you know, sister comes and asks me if I'm seeing you as a therapist, um, I cannot confirm or deny that. Wow. Oh. Because that's, that's confidentiality. As a, as a patient, you need to know that your stuff that you're talking about is going to stay secret. Yeah. And so you need to trust that that, and, and this is all based in the ethics that we sign on to. 100%. So confidentiality is of utmost importance as well. So the fit is really important and confidentiality is really important. Mm. And I mean, there are some limits of confidentiality, usually around safety issues. So if I'm concerned about the imminent safety of someone, if they're going to hurt themselves or hurt someone else, yeah. then, you know, I have to take action in some of those cases. And that's, you know, just, just part of what you should be shared and told and explained to in your first session with a therapist. Um, all of that sort of stuff so that you're super informed. That's what the aim is, is that you go into therapy knowing what to expect a little bit. Wow. And I mean, that's only up to that first session. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah, I can see that being like a very, it sounds like I feel the reason why that's such a bulk answer. Mm -hmm. 
to that first part of that is because it's such an important piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Like if that first stage goes wrong or sorry, not ideal or doesn't line up or there's no connection formed, it's like, mm, now they're SOL and then they don't really, that's like, oh, they have to do, go through the process of researching again and mm -hmm. connecting with somebody else. It's, it can be draining. Sounds like. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Everything leading up to booking and having that first session is the hardest step of finding a therapist. Yeah, no kidding. And, and I like to joke about it sometimes that it's kind of like <laughs> dating where you, you really do have to find a good fit for it to yeah. be a good experience for you. And you might hate the first couple of therapists you talk to, and that's okay. You're allowed to not like them. You're allowed to feel uncomfortable yeah. with them. But that's got to be your indicator to try somewhere else. You know, I don't think it's helpful to anyone to stay in a situation where you feel really uncomfortable um, talking uh -huh. to a therapist. You're about to share so much personal information. If you don't want to share that, you know, check mm -hmm. in with yourself about that. Like, why don't you? Is it because you don't feel uncomfortable or is it because you've never shared it with someone else and you don't mm -hmm. want to? And there's so many different reasons for that. But uh, that's the first step. And that's the hardest step is to actually like, get on a call and book an appointment with a therapist, but definitely try a couple different therapists if you don't find the right one initially. Wow. Okay. And then the rest kind of just seems to be like you have the consoles. How does it kind of go from there to almost completed service, like handshake? It's nice to see you. Yeah. Adios, amigos. Yeah, exactly. Thing. Yeah. I'll um, never see you around because we can't. Like, can you go? <laughs> like, how does that work? Um, yeah. So generally what I will say to my clients is like, I, I live and I work in Toronto. And so I will often say to them, I, that's what I do. I live and I work in Toronto. It is mm -hmm. possible that we're going to see each other around. Yeah. However, I always leave any interaction up to the patient. You know, Smart. I am going to, you know, it's not me ignoring you. It's me giving you your privacy and space to make the decision yeah. on your own. Um, right. And then I usually talk about just being aware that like, I may be with people that I know, and <clears throat> maybe with other people that you don't want them to know our relationship as like a therapist client relationship. Yeah. Otherwise it would um, be, there would be no confidentiality. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine if I like came up to you and I was like, yo, Glenn, how's it going? And, right. and then like explain to everyone around, like how we knew each other. That'd be terrible. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right now would that be okay but if, <laughs> yeah. yeah if you were my therapist i'd be a little like yo elite uh yeah. <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> yeah. Be little, yeah i'd be uh i'd be it'd be super uncomfortable and yeah, i can only that's imagine a big no -go. it's a big no-go that would be breaking a lot of confidentiality things but yeah. But uh, so from then on, from that first consult, I mean, you go through the intake and you get asked a lot of different questions um, just to get to know you. And the first couple sessions really are getting to know you still and trying to figure out, OK, what are these goals that you want to work on? Mm -hmm. And goals can be literally anything. So this is where it gets really vague. And, you know, it really depends on the type of therapist yeah. you have, the type of issue that you want to discuss. But if you're talking about anxiety, for example, then, you know, you may have a game plan of how learning how to cope and manage the anxiety or learning how to address the thoughts that trigger anxiety. And those have very, you know, step by step or practical um, stages that you can go through to manage those. Um, and depending on the therapist's approach, you may do that in a bunch of different ways. Yeah. And, you know, your goal usually has some sort of idea of what the ending will look like. So, okay, when I can go to this place and manage the anxiety a little bit better, then I will know that I'm ready to move on and reduce sessions or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And that's often what happens is that you go through therapy, you know, depending on how often it could be every week, every two weeks or whatever, depending again on the therapist and the client's discussion. And then usually what happens is there's some sort of tapering off. And so you may only see your therapist once a month or mm. once every two months. Um, yes. And then you may just not, you may just decide that you don't want to go back. Yeah, and that's don't see him at all. Yeah. And then that's when you kind of know is when you start to feel confident that you're able to manage whatever 
you came in with, then mm -hmm. that's kind of when you know that it's time to say goodbye. And having that final session with the therapist is incredibly therapeutic as well. Really? Um, because, yeah, because you can look back and see everything that you did. And you've got this like objective person to say, well, when you came in, this is how, what you told me. And yeah. now this is what you're telling me. Like, look how different that is. Yeah. You get to see them, see it through the whole process start exactly. to finish wow that sounds really rewarding yeah it like is, it is. yeah yeah, yeah no it is. it's part of it's part of what i really love and it's not always like that right, right? and and like i'm purposely not giving you any sort of timelines here yeah. because it could literally depends be on so many a things. couple sessions or it could be so many sessions yeah. you know some therapists have clients for years um, and, and they're working on different things. Like anxiety is, could be triggered by so many different things. Maybe there's historical stuff. Maybe there's trauma that's going on. Maybe mm -hmm. there's stressors that going on that are going on. And it might take a little bit of extra time to go through some of those things. And it also could just be someone's self care is to go and see a therapist and talk about what's been going on in their week. So, I mean, therapy can be for so many different purposes for so many different people, but that's kind of the general gist of nice. what therapy could look like. Interesting. I can, yeah, I can see it being very different depending on who it is, how they are, different styles, what their issues are, how old age, like there's way too many factors for it to be a, it'd be almost, it'd be naive for me or anyone, in my opinion, right? To think that there's like, like one set blueprint for every single person yeah like just oh it falls under anger management umbrella that is a huge umbrella by the way i can imagine you can attest to that correct me if i'm wrong um mm -hmm. but yeah. that's that whole like huge umbrella of anger management it's like oh well we have a blueprint for it here you go you can solve all problems like and it's kind of naive to think that way so it's yeah. it's, it's interesting <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many different types of therapy out there, um, different modalities, and some of them do give more of a blueprint than others. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, you want to work based on the evidence. I mean, therapy and psychotherapy have been around for ages, right? Like if you think of, you know, when religion was much bigger part of life, I mean, the priests were basically like counselors yeah. and still are till t to today. The emotional support that they provide to people in their congregations is, is huge. People just don't go to, don't go to their religious locations anymore um, as much. And so there are other places that are coming in, but people have been studying psychotherapy for, for hundreds and hundreds of years as well. Interesting. Mm -hmm. huh. How do you, if you can share this, if not, it's okay. Um, how do you connect with your clients? Like what is your, if you have a strategy or something or I'm, the same as you yeah. connect with anybody? I'm just real. I, you know, you would, you would, yeah. you would, you would know if I was being a little bit weird or like, you know, a little bit, you know, off putting, you would have a sense of that. Um, yeah. You would have a sense if I was like trying to sell you on something like you would have that sense, right? hundred percent. Yeah. 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 So I'm just real. I'm super transparent with my clients. I'm mm -hmm. real with them and they need to fit with who I am. And if we start therapy and then I turn into this totally different person, that's such a breach of trust. First of all, yeah. it's like, who are you? Yeah. This isn't the person yeah. that I had a consultation call with or yeah. whatever, but um, yeah, no, I'm just real. Like this is, this is yeah. me, the way that I'm conversing with you now, maybe is a little bit more familiar um, mm -hmm. because I'm actually talking about myself. Whereas yeah. in, you know, when I'm talking with my clients, I'm not talking about myself. That's not the purpose right. of therapy. Right. You're not friends having a conversation like we are yeah. right now. It's yeah. And you vote, you've never strike me as somebody who's like, you're always transparent. Like I, you're, you're like, you'll say it as it is. You'll call it like you see it and you'll say what's on your mind. It's like, <laughs> like it, that's their problem. Like it's a good thing. Right. Yeah. Like it, it's like, Hey, now there's, there's no, like, I wonder what Elise is thinking about this. Cause chances are if, you're too afraid to ask her she's already told you <laughs> um, I think it's so I'm like yeah. all right that's uh yeah so that's something that I'm like that's interesting that's cool you're like no just no bs like this is this is it what you see what you get what I'll tell you is that's smart I think that's really like that's really cool it's a really cool yeah. thing yeah absolutely so when you reconnected with me and then we kind of connected a bit further um 
And then I message you on WhatsApp, your photo. Tell me about Tasmania. Oh my goodness. Yes. So one of, I mean, I mentioned a little bit that I I spent like four years where I was traveling or I was at home um, working, right? I was, I was working. I was trying to figure out like, what are my next steps before I apply to uh, what I thought was going to be a physical therapy program. Um, So one of the things I did is I actually went to Australia to do a working holiday visa. And so with at, at that point in time, I actually don't know if this is still true, but um, if within the first year you're in Australia, you do a certain amount of time working yes. what they call like farm work, yeah. um, which basically is like any work in a, in a certain amount of uh, postcodes, basically, um, because some of them are considered like rural postcodes. And so you can uh, work there. Um, okay. So you try to work a certain amount of days in the first year that you're there, and then you get a bonus year if you do. Oh, that's cool. Oh, because I know yeah. my best friend is doing that right now. Oh, okay. So second year. You, you may know more about it than I so. would, because this was a little while ago, and they tend to know. change. It. No? I don't know. You don't talk to your friend? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, not about... Uh, Sometimes about that kind of stuff, but yeah, I think I think it's the same. I think honestly, I think it's similar. I just can't remember the exact. There are one or two things you mentioned that I don't know, but uh, <laughs> you called me out on Elise. I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't communicate with him. He's not really whatever. The, not really no, the, it's it's like visa stuff is complicated. So it is. Yeah. So when I was there, I I tried to get this second year of being in Australia by doing a couple of different jobs, yeah. um, but a lot of the jobs are seasonal. And so mm-hmm. I did a bunch of different jobs while I was there. And like my WhatsApp photo that you have, um, I'm covered in dirt because I was weeding a bean field. Yeah, that look. Thank you for that face. If you didn't see that face, it was complete and under disbelief. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. I learned so much while I was there, by the way, about about like crops and cycles and all that sort of stuff. So I was weeding a bean field because they were they were growing beans, but they had rotated crops through for potatoes a year before. And mm-hmm. I don't remember what the other the other crop was the, the mm-hmm. year before that. Um, but all these potatoes were popping up and we wanted to grow beans. And so we had to weed the potatoes out. OK, interesting. Yep. And that, that was a lot of on your hands and knees crawling through, like, imagine when you're going on a, on a, on a road, you're on a drive and you look and there's just like fields of crops in every direction. Yeah. One of those fields probably was what I was on and I was working on. Yeah. Now I'm, I can imagine not the nicest weather, like not the most comfortable weather. I should say like it's probably in the upper twenties. Right. Someone was uh, it was probably like 30 degrees most days. This was Australia coming into, uh, you know, height of the summer going into fall. So fall is coming into like March, April. Um, and I would have been doing that in like a February, March sort of time. And it was very warm. So I have, I have like this huge hat on so that I'm not getting super hit by the sun. And I have long sleeves and long pants on, even though it's really hot out, mm-hmm. um, just because the sun was so hot. Jeez. Yeah. Cause yeah. You, I was like, you're fully clothed. Like you're all covered. What? Yeah. Huh. Just to not was, get burned. Eh? Yeah, exactly. It's really hot. Oh. Um, you're in the sun from like 7 a.m. until 5 p.m. or whatever. And and uh, it's it's a long day. And there's other there's other jobs that you can do there as well. You know, there's there's apple picking and blueberry picking and mm. grape picking and and potato picking, I think. Or raspberries. And yeah. you could you could pick a lot of different types of fruits and you could do a lot of different things. And I mean, it was, it was, I, I wouldn't trade those experiences for the world. Again, that was when I was able to work with locals, like local yeah. Australian people doing some of the jobs that, um, that I was like jumping in on. And it was great. It was really good way to get to know each other and uh, hear their stories. Because again, it all came back to, I just was so interested in hearing other people's stories Mm -hmm. um, and learning about other people. Didn't matter where they were from or what they did. I just wanted to hear them. And that was just another place that I was able to do that. Do you find you get 
like almost an inside scoop or you feel like you're part of the experience that they went on when people are sharing that stuff with you? Yeah, I think that's part of being a really empathetic person is, you know, I I really can try my best to walk in their shoes a little Mm -hmm. bit to try and understand what they might have gone through. It's literally impossible to understand completely what someone else might have gone through. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, I may hear people's stories all the time, but I've not been through their life. And so I can sit Mm -hmm. here and, and like validate that, but I can't say, yeah, I know exactly what you went through for sure um but it's uh yeah it's it's really good I think to be able to understand or try to understand what other people are feeling and thinking and what their experience what their what their opinions might be yeah I think so too there's Mm -hmm. um least favorite and favorite country you've ever been to oh my goodness um okay I have mm. nice <laughs> <laughs> okay I should have known that this question was coming too this was just yeah. like <laughs> not great foresight on my part <laughs> okay two countries that I really really loved being in um I really loved New Zealand nice um New Zealand was a country that I did a lot of hiking I did a lot of cycling Mm -hmm. Um, and I did a lot of what they call like tramping. So like backpack hiking to huts and whatnot. New Zealand has hands down one of the best hiking networks in the world. I, well, actually, I don't know that, but I think it was one (laughs) of the best hiking networks. They've got so many trails and they, they have what, I don't even know what, what the acronym stands for, but they have the DOC or doc. So you can go to like a doc site and it's this um it's it's like a national conservation authority maybe that um just sets up like a lot of the huts or sets up campgrounds or sets up you know they do the maintenance on um hmm. some of the trails and everything department and they do, conservation maybe i don't know sorry you're no, probably you're probably it. totally <laughs> right on that yeah um have you been there <laughs> uh and i wish i had oh yeah. my i'd remember every minute of it yeah, so the the dock sites were awesome. You could basically just camp everywhere, um, and you don't have to drive very far. So it's not like Canada or the U.S. where you drive ten hours just to get to the next thing. It's no, absurd you, here. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah. But you know, you go you go like two or three hours, and you can make pit stops along the way and do like massive hikes, and you know everything is really well marked. And so New Zealand was really cool for all the things that are outdoorsy, um, and then to learn about the Maori, which are the people there. Um, the indigenous folks there, they're really cool. Um, and it, there's just this sense of respect in New Zealand that, uh, like, if I'm honest, isn't always present in Canada as well. Wow. Um, and I know that there are issues in every country, but New Zealand, I really felt, uh, you know, you kind of just get grounded. I don't know why that was how I felt. You just get grounded in New Zealand. Um, so New Zealand would be one of the places that I really liked. Nice. The other place that I would really like, um, that I did really like was Laos or Laos. Um, so in Southeast Asia, it mm. borders Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam actually. Um, and it's not the road most traveled or wasn't when I was there, um, but there were some really cool places there. Um, there was one place that had uh, caves everywhere. And you could go and like explore these caves and you could like rent a motorbike and, and clo- explore caves and, and like, you know, pay to get across bridges. And then you could go back and you could like, <laughs> they'd have friends on the TV and you could like sit and watch your dinner, eat your dinner or whatever. That's and then crazy. you'd be watching like friends on it. And so it was such like a, a wild world. Um, but I remember that I took a bus um, from, from two of the cities there. And it was a local bus. And I was the only English speaking white person on the bus. And, uh, like it was, it was obvious and I had to be respectful of that. And, um, the bus got in an accident. And so the bus hit a truck coming the other way. 
And I remember being terrified. I don't think I'd ever been in an accident before. Um, it was a super minor accident. Uh, but from that, I mean, I was sitting there and we were sitting in the hot mm. sun for three plus hours. And there was a woman beside me. We didn't speak any of the same languages. We couldn't understand each other at all. Um, she bought me a Coca-Cola. Nice. From the store. I don't drink pop. And so she bought me oh. a Coca-Cola. Of course I drank it. Of course I did. What was that like? But it's really sweet. Yeah, I, it's like, I understand, like I understand why I didn't drink it for so long. It was really sweet. <laughs> um, but, but it was just the kindest, most caring thing. I think that, you know, that I can remember from my entire time traveling is oh. this woman took me to find a bathroom after sitting in this bus for hours. And of course this bus has got like bags of like rice and there's like chickens and there's people with babies. And so it's like very loud on the bus. Yeah. Um, but we're waiting because the police have to come and they have to kind of fix the, the mirror on the bus and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Um, but she took me, she took me outside. She, showed, she took me to where a bathroom was. She bought me a Coke and I was just like floored um, at the kindness. And wow. that was so typical of everywhere that I went in Laos. Um, and I like for that reason, like it was just such a such a beautiful place like there was mountains there were terrible bus rides um but the people were just so lovely and i could say that about so many of the places that i went mm -hmm. but that was that was definitely a highlight for sure nice now what um what's a low light <laughs> like what's one i know i know you're very like we're all we're all about positivity and like it's good energy and stuff yeah. what's a uh like maybe or maybe not negative but what's a um just an experience that just wasn't just didn't resonate well with you or it could be like a like a big teachable moment kind of experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um Yeah, I don't know. The, the one thing that comes to my mind is when I stayed, I think I was in the Philippines and I was in a bigger city um, and I stayed in a hostel that had about 100 beds in the room. And it was like bright lights all night. The beds were super cheap, which is why I stayed there, obviously. Um, but, you know, there were bunk beds and there were so many beds and you'd have curtains to close things. And then you'd hear stuff like four people. There was like an orchestra of snoring. And I don't think I slept a wink that night. Um, got out of that city pretty quickly. I'm also not really a city person. There's not a lot of cities that I'm like, yes, I absolutely want to go there. Um, Kuala Lumpur being the exception. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Go to Kuala Lumpur. It's the best city ever. I it loved is. it so much. Um, but yeah, I just remember that being like the, the worst sleep ever. I mean, I can remember a lot of the hostels I stayed at if I like saw a picture of them or remembered them, but this one like comes to mind when I'm like, that was not a fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No kidding. Wow. Cause there's, I've definitely stayed in hostels that I'm like, oh, this is amazing. There's no one around, but the snoring, I love that term you used to like the symphony, like the orchestra yeah. of snoring. I think it was. Yeah. That's yep. I love it. That's hilarious. There's yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that hilarious when I was trying to sleep that night, but <laughs> you know, it's a after the fact thing. We can laugh about it now. Yeah. It's funny to look back on, but yeah, it probably sucked a lot. Yeah, it wasn't great. Oh. That's for sure. Jeez. So with that, what is like a misconception? kind of toward now that we're like towards the end of it what's kind of like a misconception people have or sorry that women have about traveling alone mm. I think I think people women probably feel that it might be unsafe at times to travel um and I mean they're sure yes like there's times where like you can be a target because you know people people view women as weaker a lot of the time yeah, it's not yeah it's not it's not the case a lot yeah. of the time um but I felt so safe while I was traveling I actually had no issues traveling whatsoever 
Nice. When I did start having issues is when I started traveling with a male. Ah. So when there was a guy with me, whether like whoever it was or whatever yeah. my relation was to them, um, I was completely ignored. And whoever uh, I was with, the male would be targeted for a lot more of the negative energy than um, I had ever received as a solo female traveler. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Why do you think and that is? I don't know. I, you know, I can make so many guesses about that. Um, but that was my experience. I never felt uncomfortable when I was alone. And maybe that's just because like, I'm a relatively short person. I'm pretty small in stature. Um, maybe people saw me knew that I was a foreigner, obviously. Yeah. And, um, and wanted, you know, wanted to be nice to me or something like that. Like, I can't, I can't count how many like grandmother type figures made sure that I had eaten or like nice. asked me to come over to, to speak with them or anything like that. Like, I always felt quite safe. I didn't mm -hmm. feel as, um, you know, I actually felt more unsafe from in this as a solo female traveler in Europe of all places. Wow. Um, so all through, all through Southeast Asia, all through, you know, Australia and, and other places, I, I felt perfectly safe and I may not have spoken the language or been able to read anything, but I never felt like I was in danger. Um, Europe was a little bit more sketchy if I'm honest. Huh. Yeah. And so That's people weird. think I, you know, I think people feel that when the culture is so different or the language is so different or writing is so different that it poses a lot more risk. Um, but I, that wasn't my experience mm -hmm. and traveling alone ended up being some of the most soul filling, self-reflective, uh, purposeful and meaningful experiences of my life. And I wouldn't train that for the world. I am the person that I am today because I was able to travel alone and have the experiences that I had. And so I recommend it to any female who wants to travel on her own. Mm -hmm. That's um, awesome. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, Elise, to kind of wrap up, do you have any like l things that you want to say or any like overall lessons or experiences that you'd like to pass on to the audience that has been with us for the past hour and a bit? Mm -hmm. I think two things nice. is just to reiterate a couple of things that I've said. And the first thing is you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that that makes sense when we're talking about travel, we're talking about other cultures, we're talking about your next steps after high school or your choice of friends or partner. It can be so many different things. You just don't know what you don't know. And so if you can put yourself in a place to access some of the information from someone that you trust, then your world opens. Mm -hmm. So I think that's number one. Number two is try therapy and know that your comfort and feeling that you have a good fit with the therapist is the most important thing. And to trust yourself when you are meeting a therapist for the first time to know that, you know, what a good fit is, your gut is telling you what a good fit is and to trust that. Mm -hmm. Nice. I think that's super helpful. And I think a lot of uh, people, and I know I have, some f women who are friends of mine I was talking to about this conversation that we just had and I know they're looking forward to hearing it just from and that's like they don't know you they just know you through me and what I've told them about our like uh, history and they're like oh okay like cool that's exciting so I uh, look forward to that feedback and uh, yeah I'm super grateful you're able to share your uh, very valuable time with me and uh, demand that uh, we make it happen so <laughs> here we are yeah, thank you. This has been great. So I appreciate the time and the ability to share my story, but also just a little bit more about therapy, because that's so incredibly important, I think, for all of the self development that we need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome.